Our uh, final speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Terry McCosker. So Dr. Terry McCosker was actually chair of uh, Beef 97, so had a long association with Beef Australia going back through time. Uh, Co-founder of RCS with, uh, with David Handlers here in the room, which is nice to see, back in the uh, early 80s. And so has uh, been a really uh, thought leader in agriculture for many decades now. And Terry's going to give us a bit of latest on soil health. Thanks, David. I'm old enough to remember the goons, and uh, there's a few other older people here too that got that. Uh, and there was a character in the goons, uh, it didn't matter what question he was asked, the answer was always, well I think the answer lies in the soil. <laughs> and that's about where I want to go now, and I think Charlie alluded to that as well. Uh, and there's a number of linkages that I just want to run through quickly uh, in the soil. So you'd agree with me that, that gross margin really is a function of plant productivity. So the more productivity we get, whether it's cropping, whether it's grazing, the better our gross margin is likely to be. And plant productivity is a function of our uh, plant available water and nutrients, which itself is a function of cation exchange capacity. In other words, the ability of either the humic colloids or the clay colloids in that soil to exchange moisture and nutrients uh, with the plants and the biology. And cation exchange capacity is a function of soil carbon in particular. Humic colloids uh, have about 25 times the capacity of a clay colloid to exchange and hold or, and or exchange water and nutrients. So they're the lightest particle in the soil, they're the first one that disappears when we lose soil, but they're also the most important ones. But soil organic carbon is a function of biological activity. Uh, and so the better that biology is, the more carbon we can get, and therefore the further up that chain we go. Biological activity is a function of four things, food, shelter, water, and air. And it's exactly the same for us. Those four, same four things are just as critical for our survival as they are for uh, biological survival. But you'll notice that uh, food, shelter, water and air is a function of plant productivity, which is a function of plant available water and nutrients. And so you can see that what that actually is is a cycle. And that as we start to plug the gaps within that cycle, uh, the whole system can start to regenerate in the way that uh, Charlie was talking about earlier, about nature knowing what to do. Uh, and so if we're doing things wrong, say on the right-hand side of that fence, what nature's doing, what our ecosystem's doing, is actually cycling down. And when we step into that cycle there somewhere and make a change and we can start uh, improving our ecosystem, then we can begin that spiral up. And that's really got to be our goal as managers, is where do we step in and how do we begin that upward cycle uh, to allow Mother Nature to go about healing herself. And uh, I totally agree with, with Charlie, it really comes back to the human mind. Management is the fundamental uh, base, if you like, of any change that we make to an ecosystem. It's the choices that you make as managers. Uh, it's the decisions that we make, it's how we want to run an ecosystem. And whether uh, you intend to or not, you are managing and impacting on an ecosystem either positively or negatively. So we've got to look at how we go about that. So we've got to start with, with our management decisions and then I think the next place for me where I think we can start plugging ecosystems is uh, with soil biology and I'll talk a little bit more about and that's actually where I want to focus for most of the, this afternoon. And then sometimes we actually need what I call catalytic inputs or um, fertiliser type things or some nutrients that the plant and the biology actually require. But I want to talk about what the biology can do by itself. And what's becoming apparent globally in all sorts of uh, scenarios is that what's critical to uh, ecosystem health is biodiversity. Now whether that's biodiversity of biology, whether it's biodiversity of plants or biodiversity of animals makes no difference. We need biodiversity through the entire system. Um, the thing I want to focus on uh, 
this afternoon is a process called BEAM, or Biologically Enhanced Agricultural Management, which is a process and a thought process developed by a guy called David Johnson in the United States. And uh, he's made some major breakthroughs, I think, in, uh, in agriculture. And it's, re it's interesting that the reason, I think, that he's made some major breakthroughs for agriculture is that he spent 30 years as a builder and he's working in an engineering department. So in other words, he does not have the paradigms that we have as agriculturalists or trained in old agricultural paradigms. Um, he developed the, this uh, composter uh, called the Johnson Sioux composter. And I'll, uh, at, the, at the end of this session, I'll give you a, a way of, of accessing how to build one of these. I won't go into to how to build one, but um, there's a batch. There's a bloke in southeast Queensland heard about them uh, late last year and went home and built 24. Um, which is enough to do about 10,000 hectares, I think, and he's got 1,500 hectares. Um, when the compost comes out the bottom of this, this is what it looks like. It actually comes out um, like a clay or a putty. And what he's handling there, and the reason he's got gloves on, is it's biology. Um, there's no soil left there. There's basically no nutrients left there. That is all biology. And... Um, <clears throat> Not all composts are equal. So when we talk about biology and uh, extracting biology from composts, we've got to be very careful about what compost we take it from or what compost we actually use. Um, the green ones there have come out of the, the Johnson Sioux composter and all the rest of them are commercial composts that he bought and compared to it. Um, and he also compared the nutrient uh, density of various composts to their impact on uh, plant productivity. And the, you'll see there nitrogen, so the, the tall, the red lines are actually plant production, and then the green lines or the other, the, the other lines are actually how much nutrient is in that compost. And you'll see, for example, that the ones that had the, the highest productivity had no nitrogen in them. The ones that had the highest productivity almost had the lowest phosphorus level in them. Ones that had the highest productivity had no potassium and virtually no organic matter. What that says to you that a good quality compost is not about um, nutrients. A good quality compost is about biology. And the old paradigm about compost is that we go out and we put on a tonne to the hectare or two tonnes or whatever it is and we're putting on, we think we're putting on nutrients and we're putting on uh, organic material, etc. The new paradigm around compost is what we need out of it is the biology. And if you look at the most productive ecosystems in the world, um, the, the take kelp beds and reefs, for example, they produce about 25 tonnes of dry matter a year. Uh, rainforests, um, tropical rainforests, about 22 tonnes of dry matter a year. Agricultural land produces about six and a half tonnes of dry matter a year. So in other words, where we give Mother Nature a go and get out of the way and we're not fiddling around with it, um, her capacity is up around that 20 odd tonnes of dry matter a year. And we're doing around a quarter of that. <clears throat> David Johnson's results using BEAM, uh, which is basically biologically enhanced agriculture, uh, is up around 20 tonnes of dry matter. So in other words, he's now from annual crops able to produce the same biomass that a tropical rainforest produces annually. And he believes, and some of his results are showing, that that can actually be doubled. And I'll show you some of the, the plant material. So this is one of his first experiments, and uh, on the left-hand side there, there was no compost, and on the right-hand side was compost applied. This is the Johnson Sioux compost, applied at about 200 kilos per hectare. And you'll see that the productivity in the first season was five times the yield. This is a pretty sick agricultural soil, plenty of chemicals put on it over a long period of time and not much organic matter or anything else in it. And in some of the, the trials that he's done, um, he looked at new carbon in the soil and the green line across the bottom there is the total carbon produced by roots, shoots and all the above ground part and all the below ground parts of the plant. And yet he found that there's a whole lot of new carbon in those soils. So the question is, where did that new carbon come from? And when he got in and analysed it, he found that it was entirely related to the fungal bacteria ratio. 
In other words, all of that new carbon was a function of the amount of fungi in the soil. And almost all of our soils are deficient in fungi. And so if we want to add carbon or even generally improve our soil health, then fungi's the thing that we've got to add to it significantly. And here's where the intelligence comes into the system. The soil, the plant and the biology know exactly what they need to be doing. Um, so there's the plant biomass increasing as soil organic carbon increases. But this is what happens, where the, what the plants and the biology have done to the carbon. So when we have low carbon in our soils, across on the left-hand side there, you can see that the plant and the biology is putting more carbon into the soil. And as the carbon level builds within the soil, the system knows that it doesn't need to put much, as much carbon in there. And so when you look at this threshold around about 3% organic matter, which is about 1.7% organic carbon, when we go beyond that, so carbon goes along, it builds slowly, slowly, slowly till you hit around that threshold of about 1.7% organic carbon. At that point, the system now becomes self-sustaining and it's able to build upon itself. So that spiral up starts to occur at around about that 1.7% organic carbon. And you can see in this, this set of slides that everything changes at and around that 3% that, uh, organic carbon. Um, so the, the system petitions carbon in different ways depending on how it needs it, um, which is an illustration of how intelligent um, the entire thing is. Uh, and so we, once we get above that 3% uh, organic carbon, we've got the potential to start maximising plant productivity. And I'll just whiz through these. Um, one of the things that the scientists get concerned about is as we add more and more carbon to a system, we get higher and higher respiration rates. It turns out, though, that the more carbon we have within the system, the lower the respiration rate is as a percentage of total carbon in the system. In other words, Mother Nature gets the thing more and more efficient. Mother Nature doesn't work in straight lines. Um, so this is the published literature on the rate at which we can sequester carbon. So the uh, West there uh, reckons that we can, uh, across about 67 studies around the world, that we could do 0.57 of a tonne of carbon per hectare per annum. Um, Nigley reckons we could do 0.2, and then uh, the other one there, other estimate is 0.7. That's the, what the conventional wisdom says we can do in terms of adding soil carbon. What David Johnson's averaged over the last seven years is 10.7 tonnes of carbon <coughs> added per hectare per year in an annual cropping system. But it's irrigated, and it grows two crops a year, summer and winter, so that he's got continuous plant production. And... Uh, where he's really boosted the system, he's up around 19 tonnes of dry matter a year of, of carbon sequestered per hectare per year. And all the old science, is what this is saying is that a lot of the old science around soil carbon is completely and totally wrong because all of those measurements in the old science were measured within conventional agricultural systems where we're actually degrading and mining the system. But when we know how to change that... Um, so this is a uh, uh, sunflower crop, and I want you to notice how fast this crop has grown where the soil is actually healthy. So there's, it's gone from that, the flight on the left to there in 29 days, add another 15 days, and there's your sunflower crop. The speed with which crops grow and plants grow, when they're being fed by the soil biology, the way they need to be fed uh, is very, very fast. You can see the soil in the background. This is a desert soil in New Mexico, um, irrigated in the front of it, watered, but with one dose of compost on it in the beginning. And uh, nine, 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare in the second year, 22 tonnes of dry matter per hectare in, in the third year. Um, so that shows you the system is spiralling up, and as it's spiralling up, the productivity of the system is greatly increasing. And you can see there the impact uh, on soil carbon itself. Um, 
to me, one of the most important messages out of this work is what the biology is doing to the chemistry. The old paradigm is that biology hardly existed and we can do everything we need to do with chemistry and physics. What we now know is that biology does the whole lot. Biology can fix physics and it will fix chemistry. Now, I don't know whether you can see those numbers there very clearly, but the top line is magnesium increased by 1,100% in availability in 20 months. Uh, this is with one dose of Johnson Sioux compost on it. Um, iron, 1100% increase. Nitrogen, 100 odd percent increases. So massive increases in the availability of nutrients. Um, and that's all provided by and released by the soil biology. And one of the, uh, David Johnson is now a uh, molecular microbiologist and doing some fascinating stuff uh, with the DNA. And um, this is just a, an indication of uh, the maturity pattern of the compost. So this Johnson Sioux compost takes well over a year to mature. Um, so it starts off and it, it had um, 306 species in it there in the beginning out of a total of 700 odd species of organisms. Um, but there was only 23 in the top 80%. At four weeks of age, uh, there were still only 23 species in there, slight change in what they were. Um, by the time it got to 22 weeks of age, and you'll just see from the pie chart the biodiversity increasing uh, in the compost over time, uh, we've got 57 species in the top 80% at 22 weeks, and at 60 weeks we've got 99 species in the top 80%. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that's what we want uh, in a good compost. We want that biodiversity and as it matures, then that biodiversity increases. This one's a little bit complex, complex but what it shows is the, uh, across the top line is compost treated soil, uh, again with the right compost in, in very low doses. Um, and you'll see a whole lot of green there. That means that the population of those particular organisms in that soil is actually quite a high level. The next one down has got quite a lot of white space in it. Um, that's the control that had no, it had crops grown but no um, compost on it. That means that the population of a lot of those bugs is actually quite low. And across the bottom, the desert soil with no crops ever grown in it, you can see very little green in there. In other words, the population of bugs is very, very low. But the fascinating thing is when you look up and down through that bug population, you will see that the bugs that were in that desert soil are not in the soil when the soil is healthy, right? And so what I want us to think about in, in, uh, with that sort of concept around soil biodiversity and biological biodiversity in soils is what is going on with dieback. Because to me, what we have, the, the reason of dieback is a sick system. It's, a, it's an ecology and a system out of balance. Uh, and who knows what that balance is, but you can see there that, um, that those original soils have a completely different set of biology once they're healthy. Um, and the latest research out of Europe is also showing that the greater the biodiversity um, that we have within a system, the healthier it actually gets. And it's, it's also to do with the the interaction between the bugs and uh, the way they help one another and they way, the way they work together um, has proved to be quite critical. Uh, so we can achieve some of that with multi-species uh, cropping, uh, different root systems, different plant production in our system, uh, for example. Uh, but one of the things that uh, has been, been used for a few years now in the cropping industry um, is compost extracts. Now, in, in cropping pretty easy to do because when you're planting you can uh, put some extract straight in uh, under with the seed. Um, so basically what we're ending up with here is these machines extract the biology from the compost um, and then you end up applying the equivalent of about one to two kilos of compost per hectare. Um, this is West, uh, wheat grown in West Australia and you'll notice that wheat plant there that uh, I just pulled out of the soil and the country behind it. You'll see the salt pan just through the fence. So this is uh, West Australian loam, which is essentially a mixture of sand and salt. 
Um, and it's actually, well, what's happening there is that biology is protecting and developing that root zone. Uh, and that's what all of our root systems should look like, whether we're talking perennial plants or whether we're talking uh, in a crop. And I was over there just recently and I found two green paddocks in West Australia and both of them had to happen to have planted um, uh, sweet sedan. Now one of them was conventionally grown and one of them turned out to have been grown with compost extract under it. So the one on the left there had had fertiliser put under it and uh, the one on the right had only had compost extract under it and that compost extract had been sitting in a tank for six months. So, and you'll notice the difference in the root system and the retention of soil around those root systems. And that's, again, just a good example of what it is we're trying to achieve. Uh, again, uh, wheat examples there. And you notice the one on the left, how big that radical is. So in other words, that shoot out of that seed is minute. But look at the size of the root system that's already under that plant. Uh, the one on the right is also interesting. You'll see there's two different sets of roots there. The lateral roots that are hanging down just below that and where the roots really thicken up was a hard pan in that soil. So the first roots went down and went sideways and then the biology picked up the rest of those roots and punched them through the hard pan in that soil and has gone down there about six inches or more uh, below that surface of the soil. Uh, so again, that, what the biology is doing there in a very low pH soil in a very um, sick environment, the pH is actually protecting those plants and starting to develop the, the, the uh, bugs rather, uh, protecting that soil. So what relevance is that to us in the grazing industry? Um, we've, we've just started uh, in the last few months a, a significant soil health program that's running from Canberra right through to central Queensland and uh, unfortunately didn't get going till January um, so we don't really have much in the way of results. But this week we got a few results off the first of one of the trials. Uh, this was uh, some ceteria that had actually been uh, cut back and this is the control at about 2.6 tonnes of dry matter grown in two months. The next treatment was where we put minerals on it, so we looked at what were the mineral deficiencies in that paddock and applied the minerals that that needed, so we got 4.2 tonnes of uh, dry matter. Then we put some compost on at about 500 kilos per hectare to be a bit conventional about it and make sure we were putting it on, and we got the, pretty much the same, about 4.1, 4.2 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. And then we put the extract on. So the extract is equivalent to somewhere between one and two kilos of compost per hectare, but applied in, in liquid form, just sprayed over the top of the plants. And we got four tonnes of dry matter. So that says to me that this sort of approach is applicable in the grazing industries. The cost of that compost, well, you could actually produce it yourself for nothing if you put together a Johnson Sioux composter. And the cost of that, if you buy it and put it through an extractor, is uh, somewhere around uh, 60, 70, 80 cents a, a hectare. Um, so to make that kind of difference for that sort of money is probably in the ballpark of some people. That's without application, so you've got to get it on. Um, and this one here is the first uh, little bit of feedback we had from one of the trials down south. Um, the paddock on, the, on uh, the left, actually, is the one that's actually had biology uh, put on it. Now, it's pretty hard to see, but the, the, um, the plants there where the biology went, within a month, were 75 cent, uh, centimetres, uh, 30, uh, seven and a half centimetres, 75 mils, higher than the plants on the other side. And the bricks levels are already higher in the area where the biology was applied. That means the quality of that food for animals is higher quality where the bricks level is higher. All right, so I'll pull up there. Thanks, Very good. Terry. Thanks, Terry.